Welcome to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. In-depth conversations and opinion covering a variety of topics from the world of news, sports, and more. Here's Mike McFeely. All right, welcome to another episode of the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inform.com. And I have a couple of special guests on the pod today. Um, And we're going to talk about a story that they collaborated on that ran gosh, 10 days ago or so, something like that, at Inforum.com and in the print edition of the forum. And my guests are Melissa Vanderstad, a reporter for the forum, and Anna Page, the photo chief for the forum. Welcome uh, to the pod. Thanks for joining me. I know you have very busy days, as most of us do, or many of us do. But I, I did want to touch on this. I just thought this was such an impactful story when I read it. And I know that it was impactful for a lot of readers because I've had, uh, I wrote my newsletter about it last week and got some feedback through email from some readers who kind of felt the same way I did. And just for the benefit of the listeners, uh, the story was headlined, what's it like to be homeless in Fargo? Woman who sleeps downtown shares a day in her life. And what Melissa and Anna did was they followed a 72-year-old woman, which is a whole different story in and of itself, and that's one of the things that had an impact on me, was the fact she's 72. But her name is, is it Lo- Lowry or Lo- Lori? How does she pronounce her name? I think she pronounces it Lori. Okay, it's Lori. It's spelled Lowry, though. Okay, but. it's spelled like Lowry, but it's Lori Hoganson, and uh, she is homeless in downtown Fargo with many others, Unfortunately, but she allowed uh, these two women into her life for about 16 hours one day. And what resulted in it uh, was just, I thought, some fantastic journalism. And so thank, thank you for you. doing the story, thank guys. You. I mean, thank you. great stuff. Melissa, let me start with you, uh, as you were the main reporter and writer of the story. How did you come up with this idea? How did you execute the idea? How did you find Lori? Walk us through how this happened, because this is an idea I think that many of us you know, might run across, but we'd never followed through on it. You did. So tell us how, as a reporter, you came up with the idea and executed the plan. Thank you. Yeah, I think it really came up pretty organically. I want to say um, the topic of homelessness has been a huge subject in one of my beats, which is the Fargo City Hall recently. We've seen a rise in the visibility of homelessness in our downtown, specifically along the riverbanks, but also con- congregated in the downtown core. You know, there's many reasons for that, but the reality is that it is there, it is very visible, and it is a huge talking point amongst businesses, city leaders, Fargo residents. And I think the question of how do people spend their time, what do people who are unhoused do with their time was really what drove the story. Uh, Every single person who's unhoused that I've ever spoken to has been very eager to chat and share with me, partially because I get a sense of boredom from them a little bit. You know, their days are filled with stress oftentimes, but they spend a lot of time sitting and waiting and waiting for the bus, waiting for services, waiting for the next opportunity to go walk four miles and get a meal. So I think just the realities of their day was something I was really curious about, and I brought it up to my editor, uh, Katie Young, and she was incredibly receptive to the idea. I know we saw a lot of receptive uh, responses from the editor team as a whole, and then we brought Anna Page in, who was also incredibly excited and supportive about the idea. And then it was just a matter of waiting for the right um, subject to come along. You know, we met a lot of unhoused people who I think would have been just as good a fits, and ultimately it was just a kind of happenstance that we chose Lori. I met her through another unhoused person, and she seemed very eager to share her story. I'd connected with her multiple times, and she was just very transparent with what she was going to through. and. I felt she'd be a good fit, and she agreed to do it. Let me ask you this. Did did you walk around downtown Fargo and approach homeless people and say, hi, I'm Melissa, I write for the forum, could I talk with you? I mean, did you pitch this idea to other people, and then you eventually came into contact with Lori? No. um, I... I approached um, people who are unhoused many times for different stories, you know, reactions to news that's breaking out of City Hall, questions about their realities. We did one with a group of people who were living under the First Avenue Bridge who were also very transparent and honest with us about their experiences and the realities of their lives. 
So I think we really waited until the right person came along and then just kind of pitched the idea. I got the approval from Katie because it's a significant amount of time and resources for the forum to expend on this story, which ultimately is now unpaywalled, I believe. So it's free for all our audiences mm -hmm. to read and consume. And they were they gave their stamp of approval, and I've never spent that long on a story before, so it was a powerful moment. So just finding the right person, and when I asked her, she was immediately receptive to the idea. Anna, what was your role in this? I mean, Melissa said she approached you, and you were part of the conversations. Explain what how you looked at it and, and what was your role in this in this package? Yeah, I'm fairly new to the forum. I came in January um, working with the business and features team and I have been photo editor only um, a few months. This was really early into starting the position, but I was very interested in collaborating with our reporters. I think we can get really good work done when we combine um, our strengths. And as a visual storyteller, I knew that it was important to show the realities of people living on the streets. Oftentimes, news coverage is removed. It's from um, a safe distance with a zoom lens. Mm -hmm. For instance, you're not necessarily in the camp living that life, or even for a moment or a day, you're you're removed from the, the story. And I thought, we need to show more faces. We sh need to sh humanize these, these struggles that these people go through every day. So when um, Katie and Melissa brought me to the table to say, hey, could you spend a day doing this? Would we, you know, based on our photo schedule, would we have multiple people coming and going? And I thought to myself, you have to have the rapport your subject has to know you. They have to trust you and be comfortable with you to, to be that vulnerable, to really expose, you know, this intimate part of, of their lives. Like we talked about bathrooms and medications and where somebody sleeps at night is a very, it should be a very private thing, but it's not for them. So um, I was really interested in showing the human side of homelessness um melissa so the the you spent one entire day so was it 16 hours i think you said you spent from 8 a.m 7 a.m i'm sorry yeah. pardon me i'm yep. sorry i'm the My night bad. reporter so 7 a.m was quite the thing <laughs> yeah, for me so, so 7 a.m until 11 p.m Correct. Correct. Yeah. And that was the plan. And that's your, your subject. Lori was she was OK with that. She was actually when I initially approached her about the idea, she was her immediate response was, why don't you spend the night with us here at the Civic Center? You know, we'll look out for you. We'll get you some cardboard. You can sleep here, really have that experience. And we ultimately decided against doing that for a variety of reasons. But I think the offer was very much appreciated and it was emblematic of how willing she was and eager she is to share her story in the hopes that people can hear it and connect and find some common goal behind all this situation, some purpose behind what she's going through. And, and you answered my next question, which is, wh why do you think that she was so open to you guys? I mean, she, she opened up a, a page of her life knowing that there was going to be thousands and thousands of people learning about her and her struggles and her hopes and her dreams and all these. She was very frank with many things, judging by reading your story. Why, why do you think that was? Do you want to grab this one, Anna, or do you want me to? Well, I noticed throughout your conversations, you asked really good questions of, of Lori throughout the day. One of the things that kept coming up for her and why she was willing to do this was that she views herself as an advocate for other people who are experiencing homelessness. So she calls herself a homeless advocate. And so it's obvious when we're on the streets with her, she'll give somebody a chug off of her soda. She will pull cardboard out of a dumpster for her fellow um, um, folks who are with her. So I think she's naturally a giving person who ended up in a a really difficult situation, but I think it was because she felt a calling to be an advocate and a voice for those who maybe weren't in a position to do that. So, when I I'll, I'll, let me give you some of my thoughts, and you guys can react to them, and we can go whichever way you want to go. But when I read the story, again, one of the main things that stood out to me 
was that Lori was 72 years old, mm. and I'm 58, and I can barely get out of my bed in the morning just because of the life I live and the things I do and everything else. Um, and I'm in fairly reasonable, decent shape. I've always had a roof over my head, always had food in my stomach, always had a warm place to sleep, always had a bathroom to use. That's never been an issue for my 58 years. I can't imagine being 72 years old and being on the street and living, sleeping on concrete and being out in the elements every day. So that, that part just like floored me. And I don't know why I thought that, that homelessness was a a, a young person's game, for, for lack of a better term, but it, it's all ages, apparently, which is stupid of me to not know that, but is Lori an aberration with her age, or are there others as old as she is or older than she is on the streets of Fargo? There are people of every age and every walk of life. You know, there's so many people that I've met through Lori that whose stories didn't make it into the article just for space. You know, she was even more transparent than you can get by reading the story or watching Anna's video, which is phenomenal. Um, there's a woman in a wheelchair who sleeps in her chair every night because it's easier for her than laying on the ground. I know when Laurie first arrived in Fargo, she slept on the benches outside of the Fargo library, and that was where she slept until she met Alan and Elizabeth. And now, for safety, she sleeps closer to them on the ground, but it's very hard on her back, she said. And... You know, I've, I've seen what she eats every day, and it is more not enough, I would say, for a person to sustain themselves. And we saw was an irregular day. You know, she had Burger King or Dairy Queen, wasn't Dairy it? Dairy Queen, I think it Dairy was. Which, okay. which, which, again, and that's another part of this, this conversation is not only, not only was she not eating enough, I mean, Dairy Queen is maybe that was a treat for her that day. I don't know, but that's not... Not a great diet for a 72-year-old person living on the streets to, to have that day. You'd hope that there would be something more nutritious than that. Yeah, I mean, I think it was hard to gauge what her true day-to-day -day would look like because Lori planned some special things that day, mm -hmm. including getting her hair done. And while we were in that area, there was a burger, or excuse me, a Dairy Queen right by the bus stop. And so I think some of the choices she made, like Sandy's Donuts in the morning, um, I overheard Elizabeth later on that day saying that that was a big expense, you know. So I know that these things probably weren't part of her everyday life. Maybe even she wouldn't have that many calories on a normal day. And so we thought actually the Dairy Queen was one of the more healthy things that she ate because there was mm. meat and there was protein. Oh. I suppose, there, right? yeah. 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 So, but um, you know, I I came in the morning and I took a break in the afternoon, and Melissa stayed the whole time, and I went home. I ate. I I I relaxed a little bit, and Melissa was there the whole time. And I said, "Well, let me come alleviate you. Let me bring you some food." And I think um, kudos to you, Melissa, for really wanting to be present for everything and not miss these interactions that came so suddenly, these crises that would seemingly come out of um, out of nowhere or just the interaction points as the day got longer. It got, um, it got more uncomfortable as people in varying states of, of where they're at in their day became more aggressive. I think as night falls, people get a little bit... Um, more un unnerved and you know I even offered to bring you food at some point and I know that you said well I don't want to eat in front of them mm -hmm. which I think is a really human response and also a really um, important piece of the story is that we wanted to truly experience that that life mm -hmm. even for a day I think it was a life-changing story for both of us I agree yeah yeah and that's it was a life-changing and again I it's not like all of us, I've been around a little bit. I've been to, I've seen plenty of homeless people. Um, there obviously is a homeless population in Moorhead. There's one in Fargo. There are, in, there are homeless people in West Fargo. They're in every community of substantial size in varying degrees. I mean, so, but it, this, when I read it, it humanized homeless people for me. And it's not that I'm not empathetic. Um, if I can get an editorial comment in here that it doesn't affect you guys, I'm not Dave Pepcorn, the city commissioner, 
who's wanting to round these people up and kick them out of town or put them on the train or turn off their heat. It's just that I haven't, frankly, if, if there's an interaction with somebody and they ask me for money, if I have a couple of bucks, I'll give it to them. If I don't, I'll just be honest. I go, I don't have any money on me. I'm sorry. You know, whatever. But I don't, I, I've never really stopped and thought, well, what do they do the other 23 hours and 59 minutes that, that I don't have an interaction with them? It, and so it, it just, it, it humanized Lori and all of her colleagues because it told me what they did and how they lived and how they survived. And I, you guys had to have that same feeling as because you just, you just mentioned, right? Yeah, one thing that really struck me is the amount of time it takes them to do something that we would not think twice about. I met someone at the Churches United shelter one day who was having a meal there with her young children, and it took her many hours to get there from her apartment to get to the dinner and then to get home again. So for something as small as food insecurity, she had to put hours of her day into getting her kids a meal. And, you know, Lori, we saw the same bus transportation, a little bit slower than your average thing. She had to stand around many hours watching her belongings because she had nowhere to put them. Mm-hmm. What is she going to do? She can't leave her things. So, and Yeah, and that speaks to the need for community, too, because there was part of the day where some of her community watched over her things. And, mm-hmm. you know, you just... You can't be on the streets without some level of possession if, if you're in Fargo, North Dakota in October. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's only going to get colder, and dispersing homeless people isn't a solution. It's just hiding them away. And I will say, I'm from a small town, and we have homeless people in my small mm-hmm. town as well. They are, I don't know of many communities that aren't being touched by this. It's a nationwide um, epidemic. So there were two people who were... There's more than two, but there's a couple that were particularly central to the story. Um, 46-year-old Alan Cook and his adopted daughter, Elizabeth Cook, who's 24, and then their friend Chris, who declined to give his last name. Describe the relationship between them and Lori, and how did they meet? Is it... I I get the sense, and and shoot me down if I'm wrong, that, that obviously, like all humans... Homeless people are looking for community and friends and relatives, quote unquote relatives, and just for a sense of safety and well being and security. But what, what's the relationships here between some of the principles in, in your story, Melissa? Mm-hmm. I think what we saw all day was a lot of people looking out for each other in a lot of big or small ways. I know I didn't catch this until you. I saw your video, but Lori actually covered up the man at night who came and kind of crashed out and passed out on the ground, cold concrete, no cardboard, no blanket, and she covered him up with a blanket. So it's just those little moments of care. But I can't speak to Chris. I'd never met him before that 7 a.m. early morning meeting, but I know Alan and Elizabeth fairly well from past stories, and I think they kind of met Lori. I've never really asked how, but they've kind of taken her under their wing a little bit, and the three of them have become a bit of a camp, I would say. They have rules. They have, you know, things you can and cannot do in their sleeping spot. They invite people in to to sleep with them if they trust them. I think they just look out for each other. And Lori seemed to be looking out for Chris as well. Are are there cliques of people or groups of people among the homeless in Fargo that if you have this group and this group, you know what I'm getting at is that are there, I mean, we all, we're all, again, we're all human. You know, our, our newsroom out here has groups of people who hang out more than they do with others. And is it like that on the streets of Fargo? I would say from my limited observations that, yeah, there are groups of people that will call out to each other when they see them on the streets and stop and have a conversation. Um, one gentleman stopped. He was looking for his girlfriend. And, I mean, people look out for each other. And Lori herself talked about she goes on several walks every day up and down Broadway with the point to be seen. This is this is her words. I want to I want to make a, a presence. Mm-hmm. And then that gives her a chance to sort of assess where people are. There was also a moment, I think the only moment I felt mildly uncomfortable is when I turned my lens towards the library to get an evening shot of like a silhouette of somebody. Um, and there were a couple folks who were in that area and the one woman started yelling at me not to take their photo. And 
I explained that I wasn't photographing them and showed them what I was doing. And I said, I wouldn't take your photo without your permission. And she seemed to allude that lots of people do. Right. So I think it's, again, that like removed perspective, like let's let's show this from afar, from a safe distance. Um, And I think I learned a lot in that moment that these folks just want to be treated like we would treat anyone else. But the gentleman that was with her was very intoxicated um, to an unsafe manner. He's the one who came and passed out at Lori's camp. He's also a person that has caused disruption in the past, but yet she still pulled a blanket out of her bag and put it over him and said, this one's out cold. We won't have to worry about him. So I think they all know each other. They all know each other's tendencies. And Lori was advocating for another person to, um, you know, maybe uh, try to get sober and so you know like they're they're all hoping for the best for one another in these difficult situations it seems like so one of the things you wrote melissa was as they wait for the downtown engagement center's 8 a.m opening the group casually discusses some of the things they see out here sex trafficking drug use and the people who disappear out of their lives leaving them to hope that they moved on to bigger and better things Mm -hmm. Are, are those things are the drugs the Uh, substance abuse, sex trafficking, and people kind of just going in and out of their lives, is is that common? Is that every day on the streets of Fargo for the homeless population? I can't speak to that, but I think from their conversation, they talked about it so casually that I would assume that it's something that they see on a regular basis. You know, I think that's a that paragraph is a credit to our editor because we could have written an entire article just on the past experiences they discussed at that 7 a.m. waiting time while they waited for the deck. I mean, the things that they live through on a daily basis, I can't imagine how you experience those and it doesn't change you. So... Well, and the services gap between having to leave the Civic Center at 7 a.m. but having nowhere to go until 8 a.m., and there is this just this lull of time where you don't belong anywhere. You're not mm-hmm. welcomed here. You're not welcomed there. Where are you to go? Mm-hmm. It, the, the word that kept coming to my mind when I read it was chaos. Like, it, it, is it, it's daily chaos just to wake up in the morning and then to live your life until you go to bed at night. It just seems like it's, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how some of these folks can can get through the day. I couldn't get through the day. It's very unpredictable. I mean, it's very unpredictable, chaotic. I mean, generally, my day, our days are, again, we have a place to live. Some of us have families or or friends or whatever. Everything is sort of programmed to a certain extent. And then sometimes they get thrown off, and then it's, ah, you know, you, you deal with that. But this is every day is chaos. Well, and I think there is a, I mean, at least for Lori and her crew, their day is structured around their belongings. You know, like, where Mm. are we going to keep these things safe, right? And even when we, Melissa and I, the first go-round when the engagement center opened, we just went in, and the staff allowed us in. So we got to see inside the downtown engagement center There were lockers in the main common room, and on them in Sharpie was written, no lock, no lock. Almost all of them had no locks or somebody's name on them. So Mm -hmm. something as simple as securing your possessions, your medications, your, your needs for the day are very difficult. And so that is a reason to to partner up, is to just make sure that somebody else has your back while you're doing something as routine for us as a shower, which Lori doesn't shower often because yeah, there that's what is, she said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there is no security for her belongings. There is no real privacy there. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And it's got to be um, incredibly uncomfortable to, to leave your entire world behind at, um, you know, just to get a shower. I think there was a very pervasive fear about things being stolen or lost or these are all the things you have in the world. You rely on them. You depend on them. And if they're gone, they're gone forever. And I, that daily chaos you referred to, I can't tell you how many people we met that day who were just talking casually about missed doctor's appointments and missed appointments in general. You know, And these are people who have real need for health care and various appointments to find housing, services, shelter, et cetera. But... 
they just can't make those things because things pop up, you know? Another thing that struck me uh, was e even with the t difficult positions in which they find themselves living on the streets, there's still hope. They still have hope. Like Lori still has hope that things are going to get better. And, and humor. I, oh, think oh, okay. I think those two <laughs> things were like embedded together. Okay. We saw them very hopeful and also laughing a lot, teasing each other. There were moments of levity throughout the day where there was laughter. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where hope lives. And I, I know that you had mentioned that some of the, the people talk about they're ready to give up. And, but, but at least in Lori's case and some of the others, you know, she talked about opening a like a, a ranch for homeless people so they'd have a place to live. That's a pretty aspirational thought for somebody who's trying to figure out a way to live day to day on the street. Uh, another thing you wrote about extensively that we can maybe delve deeper into is that she believed that she had uh, a potential mate living in Florida that she said she was going to marry. And in fact, she talked about a, a wedding dress quite a bit and we can again we can delve into that but that but that's hope right i mean that's mm -hmm. that's hope for something better to come and i don't know how realistic anything is i, I don't know if this person frankly exists that she's talking about in florida when i read the story i kind of went well okay i mean there's something that she has there how real it is i don't know mm -hmm. but she has hope that something better is going to come her way mm -hmm. i was really curious, Melissa, how you worked on the writing. When we got through this whole day, I was just grateful that I took photos. Honestly, I would not have wanted to write that story. There was so much data, so much information, and it was also hard to parse out what was fact from what w was fiction, or just um, being taken advantage of at a gross nature that we can't, and, yes. we can't and, and, prove and we don't really necessarily, we didn't set into this story expecting that that was going to be a major part of the narrative, but the husband kept coming up and the more that we asked questions, the more that it seemed to be a nefarious situation yep. on whoever this person's part is, but we don't know the truth. Right. So and I was that's, wondering and that's, how you got through that, parse that out. And, and again, when I, when I read it, I, I think that, that many reasonable people would read that about that situation about the man in Florida and she was sending money to him I think that many reasonable people would say hey that's probably not a good situation but I mean mm -hmm. to tell you know, just maybe talk about a little bit about what you talked about in that situation with Lori in that situation with, with Lori and what you made of it that was definitely something we did not know going in. It came up very organically, and I think we were discussing it as we walked through the West Acres Mall, and I think me and Anna kind of looked at each other and knew that this was a situation that maybe needed a bit more diving into a little bit. And throughout the day, Lori was completely transparent with us, and she continued to be so. And I think to best represent her realities, we wrote and shared in the article, her realities as she sees them, and we'll leave it to the to the readers to interpret her narrative and her realities as they see fit. I will say that the man that she says that she is married to is a real person. We have looked him up. He is a professional uh, wrestler. We have elected not to name him for his privacy. Um, Wikipedia lists him as married to another person. However, Lori says that he had that marriage annulled and that he is now married to her. She has never talked to him in person, only on Facebook. She has sent him money. Um, she's obviously had family and some sort of court system concerned enough about her well-being that they removed her finances from her control. Um, and, that, and that's actually split her with her daughter because yeah. her daughter has, it sounds like, stepped in to try to stop perhaps that situation from happening. Yeah, I believe that she's been um, determined to be a vulnerable adult, which has um, some legal repercussions to it financially. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I appreciate that answer because I, I think when I read your story, I saw the reality of Lori's day to day. And that was mm -hmm. to not editorialize it, to not sort of like dig deeper into these, like we're journalists, we're, we want to, we want to know the truth of these things. We want to get to the bottom of them, but that wasn't the goal of this story. And I think mm -hmm. to share her worldview and the ways that 
she's experiencing it was really powerful. And I think her realities, thank you, Anna, just make the story and the any possible solution that one might seek here so much more complex. And, you know, Alan is in the midst of seeking housing, and it's going very well for him. He's very determined. But Lori does not want housing. She wants to go to Florida because she has a house there, she says, with her husband. She has cars. She has everything she needs in Florida, and she is looking to get to Florida. But the services here do not want to send her to Florida. She did not say why, but so, and we've asked her repeatedly, what will she do come winter? You know, it's cold. She refuses to use many of the the services around town because of personal experiences that she has related to us that she feels those are not suitable for her and her safety and her belongings. But she does not have a plan for this winter. She is planning to go to Florida and will not think of what she might do if that plan does not come to fruition. <laughs> Is is that typical? You said that Alan Cook was trying to find housing and was and was having making some headway there, whereas Lori is is has something else in her mind. Is it? Are there many people in your experiences who are thinking long term, or is it just a matter of day day to day survival for many of them? Because I w I would think being very inexperienced and naive, that thinking more you know, past the next day would be really difficult because you're just trying to think of where your next, it's what I've always, when I argue with people about, you know, kids, uh, you know, getting free meals at school and you try to explain to them, it's a little hard to think about what five and five is when you're thinking about your stomach is empty and you're wondering where your next meal is going to come from. And I would think that there's some of that living, being a homeless person anywhere is, your number one priority is food, shelter, safety. And so there doesn't, wouldn't seem to be a lot of time or energy left over to think about what am I, where am I going to be in three months from now? Is that the reality that, that you think is there? And I, I know mean, it's probably speculation, but we can do that. It is speculation, but I would say that I could equate it to something that maybe we might be more familiar with, which is like a debt load. Let's say you get into over your head in debt and you make those minimum payments, but you're only paying the interest. You're never really going to get out of debt unless you start a serious, you know, financial adjustment and make a concerted effort. And I think finding housing is a lot like that. But what I, what I've felt all along and when I saw Lori's situation and experienced it, it drove home the fact that all of us are one or two choices or circumstances or addictions away from, from that place. Lori's started with a pandemic rent increase and she couldn't make it work. And it sounds like she was able to negotiate with her landlord for a bit, but once she lost housing, it became very slippery slope for her. And when you compound um, other factors in your life, I think it's very difficult, yeah, to get out of that reactionary mode, that survival mode. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 survival mode is a is a really important part of our human experience. But I think when you're on the streets like that, it you know the the line shifts, right? And I, I think that that might be creating for people nervousness, but you know, you, you never know what to expect. Like Lori carries around mm -hmm. a spear that somebody made for her just in case. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. Melissa, you might be able to add to this too, but I mean, I think about protection as a woman out on the streets at night and when we would go out on assignments, we would make sure to go out in pairs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want um, members of our staff to to be in difficult situations without some support and a full knowledge of the editors as to where we're at at any given point. How lucky are we to have those kinds of resources? Right. And so let me let me dovetail into that then, Melissa. Is it, it is it dangerous to live on the streets of Fargo? If you are a homeless person, obviously there's there's dangers. But is it? Did you feel that, that it was just a constant state of of danger and that these folks are, you know, just in a, in a bad place all the time. I never felt 
in danger, if that makes sense. But it was definitely chaotic at times. You see people in various states of inebriation. And most commonly when people see that or are inebriated, they're in the privacy of their own homes. So everyone is at risk for consuming alcohol or drugs in a way that is not healthy to their well-being. However, when people who are unhoused do it, it's very visible to everyone who is also unhoused. It's visible to the people who are going by. And like you said, they're in these daily traumas that make it very difficult to navigate and cope. So while I didn't feel in danger, I know the statistics definitely back up that unhoused people are far more likely to be victims of crimes nationwide. We just had an unhoused woman who was sexually assaulted under, I think, the main bridge, the First Avenue Bridge, a couple of months ago. So it's... Well, and the dangers, too, I think, come from a lack of access to health care and uh, appropriate health care, culturally mm-hmm. appropriate health care as well. Um, I think th- the health issues that people shared with us were really overwhelming mm-hmm. and their need for treatment um, was great, but their access to that treatment was not. Let me just briefly share Chris's story because I think it got cut for space. But when we were having donuts, he told us a little bit about his health issues. He slipped and fell in Fargo on some steps last winter and absolutely shattered his knee. And he was required to wear, I think, a leg brace and a medical wrapping on it, which he was not able to do because he's on the streets. And then he had to use a crutch, which he stopped using because it was bruising up his entire arm and elbow. And then he tore all the ligaments out of it with another fall, I believe. And now he's just in constant pain. He's not wearing any of his medical gear. He's left some of it at a friend's house because how is he going to carry around a crutch? You know, he drinks to numb the pain, he said. When we ran into him later that day, he was in a mild state of inebriation. So... And then you asked, Mike, about whether this is people looking long-term to try to plan or just trying to survive their daily realities. And I think it's a bit of both, but also there are systemic barriers that they're trying to overcome that are no fault of their own. I've run into another gentleman who, through his disability benefits, has the money for an apartment, but he cannot find someone to rent for him after his eviction because he has a criminal record. So he was on the streets with the money to pay for housing, and he just could not get housing. And he did not want to be there. He was actively looking for a way off. He was working through the systems, but we're seeing systems that are full, waitlist, that are closing down because there's no room. There's not enough shelter beds for people. Let's say just think the realities we're looking at in Fargo. Was it hard to do this story? Because I I was heartbroken. I mean, it, 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 I was, I, you know, I was, I was educated by reading it. I was uh, shocked by a couple things. I was uh, just, uh, you know, again, it, it humanized homeless people for me in a way that I, that I hadn't experienced before. But in the end, I was heartbroken. I mean, again, these, I mean, these are human beings. They're our neighbors. And as, as Anna said, it, you know, there but for the grace of God, it could happen to anybody. Yeah. I mean, it really could. I mean, it, any, any middle class person or you know below the social strata it could, this could happen to i mean was it i think was it was it, it heartbreak was it hard to do the story it was remarkably hard yeah and from a journalistic perspective you're trying to balance the necessity of telling the stories that are going on in your community and also not exploiting people we want to tell people stories to document history to document their realities but we also are not interested in taking their stories and putting them out there and having nothing come of it. You know, I hope people read it and can have a deeper understanding of their realities. And I think, from my perspective at least, I don't want to speak for Anna, there was a remarkable pressure to do their story justice in a way that is both honest and truthful to the situation we experienced and also tells their story in a way that they would hope it is told. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. Respectful, right? I mean, it's... Just, just be respectful, and I, and you were, mm-hmm. and it's. I mean, it was, it was incredibly respectful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Lori broke my heart. I absolutely get teary eyed just thinking about that experience. From the mor- moment I met her, she's carrying around a big, beautiful teddy bear that she can use a, as a pillow at night, named Paddington, and seeing her in that barber's chair getting her hair washed and curled and being treated like a human being being treated with 
dignity and respect welcomed into that salon despite her circumstances, how she may have appeared. Um, to see the smile on her face when her hair got curled, I got that picture and it breaks my heart when I see it. But she was so funny too. There's a moment where it's dark and I'm following her behind the Civic Center and she's pulling out cardboard boxes to look for good material to bed down on and there's a box that has made a frame and she holds it up and she looks through it and she goes, I've been framed! And then she does it in like the, um, oh my gosh, the Ace Ventura voice. And oh I'm just, God. I mean, she's just, she's hilarious. And mm-hmm. at night when they're like, she's laying one thin blanket on that cardboard to lay down on. And there's a smile on their face in those last pictures. They're smiling. They're mm-hmm. joking. And that resilience just stuck with me. I I drive by the Civic Center every single day and look for them. And it was very hard, I think, for Melissa and I both to not interject. interject. Like, didn't we want to buy her a meal? Didn't we want to bring them, you know, water? Didn't we want to, like, do what we could? Do I have a bunch of blankets that I want to d- donate? Whatever. It, I don't know what's needed. I don't know how to fix this. I know that I can. And to be an observer to that and just step back, that w- that was a hard one. And I will say, I have a list of other people that I could write the same story on tomorrow. The Lori was not an exception. She is one of dozens, hundreds in the metro area who we could write this exact same story tomorrow. So we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you. Thanks for doing this, but more importantly, I think thanks for doing the story. I mean, it was again eye-opening and heartbreaking and all educational and all those things for me. So Melissa Vanderstad, reporter, Anna Page, photo editor of the forum, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. This has been the McFeely Mess Podcast, Inforum.com. Thanks for listening, and we will talk again soon. Thanks for listening to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. For more podcasts and columns, head to Inforum.com and search Mike McFeely 